Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. I've got a guest. My guest today is Alex Kochman. Uh, he is a husband and a father. Of course, he's a follower of Christ. He works uh, for a missions organization. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about missions and evangelism and just cultural stuff today. So welcome to the show, Alex Kochman. Yeah, thanks for having me, Richard. Yeah, I'm Director of Advancement and Communications with ABWE. We're an international missions agency serving all over the world. And I have the privilege of helping put out content for the local church every day. So it's good to be here. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we met a few years. Was it 2019, I guess, right? Spring of 19 when you were that in That sounds about right. Yeah. I think it was. And May? Then we visited. Something yeah. like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you took yeah. me to lunch there. That was good. Um, and then we visited up in uh, Pennsylvania. Was it Harrisburg? Is that where you all are at? That's right. We're just outside Harrisburg, which uh, somebody said to me the other day, hey, I didn't know Pennsylvania had a middle. Most people don't. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yes, we do. We do have a middle and we're in it. Nice. Yeah. Y'all got a great facility there. I mean, that. I mean, it, it was like an old, wasn't it like an old house or something like that? And it was like kind of fleshed out and built. Yeah. The miracle on the mountain. Yeah. It was a converted mansion. The owner wasn't a believer about 30 years ago, sold it to us for half of what it was worth. It was, it was a God thing. I hate that expression. Everything's a God thing, but this yeah. was a God thing. <laughs> And uh, built on the rest of it, training facilities, offices with volunteer labor from a dozen different countries. Um, and that was mm. 25, 30 years ago. So, yeah, God's been wow. good to us. We've got a big campus up here. You ought to visit sometime. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is very cool. Um, well, it's uh, it's crazy, right? Our world is crazy. <laughs> it's been crazy a little bit, a little bit. The whole time. I've seen a few um, things. Yeah. And uh, it seems like stuff kind of things get pulled back and we see more crazy and then it kind of gets covered up and different crazy happens. Um, But one thing, why don't you flesh out a little bit more about ABWE and just kind of um, I know a lot of people talk about missions and it's I mean, especially being in seminary, it was huge in missions and who's going to be missionary. And then a lot of people stop. I know the statistic is, you know, 90 plus seminary graduates percent don't. They stay Mm. domestic, right? They stay in the States. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about just kind of ABWE's um, focus and how you all seek to either find and recruit missionaries and how you support missionaries on the field? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I wonder if there's a similar statistic just for people that explore missions at all and 90% of them stop. You know, you do see a lot of that, right? There's yeah. a million reasons to stay and sometimes it's hard to find the reasons to go. But we've existed for about 94 years now. Uh, we were actually founded as a missionary with what was at the time the Northern Baptist Union during okay. the fundamentalist modernist controversies uh, that a lot of us have studied from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they fell to uh, the spirit of the age and they asked their missionaries to stop doing conversionary evangelism. Dr. Raphael Thomas was a medical missionary in the Philippines. They basically told him, Stop doing conversion. Stop trying to preach the gospel. Just focus on mercy ministry, social welfare type of work. Mm. And uh, and he said no. And he left, came back to the United States, uh, convened with some friends and family and, and some partners and supporters and went back under a new mission organization that he had helped found, uh, which became over time uh, what we now call ABWE, began under a different name because we were at first, we were just in Asia. Uh, yeah. And then throughout the events of World War II, um, we couldn't just be in the Philippines. The Japanese came in and invaded and um, some incredible stories of uh, devotion to the Lord and bravery of our missionaries that were taken as prisoners of war in the 40s when the Japanese came in. Uh, of course, uh, they were liberated. and uh, but, but ABWE at that point had the impetus to spread throughout the world. And today we're reaching into 84 countries. We have about a thousand missionaries and everything that we do is evangelism, discipleship, church planting, training of national leaders through any skill, any opportunity or excuse to build relationship uh, in some of the countries where we serve. We serve in teams that are devoted to uh, multiplying local churches that are biblical uh, and healthy Mm. and uh, that that have the word at, at the center of all of that. So that's what we do. And we work with local churches that are trying to send their missionaries, churches that want to have um, the logistical support, the training, the leadership, the resources that can come from being connected with a network and with an agency, uh, mm-hmm. but also they want to have a direct hand in, in shepherding and caring for those missionaries in being the real sender and being the spiritual authority over those missionaries, not just delegating all of that to a parachurch organization. So we have about 400 sending churches that partner with us in that way, probably okay. another three or 4,000 that support our missionaries 
uh, serving across the world. And we're just trying to help the local church do what it's been called to do, which is make disciples. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's good. Um, yeah, it's exciting. I mean, definitely having, having, I mean, it's just, it's essential, <laughs> especially when you're, when you're being told, I mean, years ago now, but that's kind of crept up again quite a bit and depends on what type of the, or what area of the church so-called you look at. There's a lot of people that could care less about converting to Christ, <laughs> you know, repenting and believing, which is just, you know, if you kind of step back, some people are just might be aghast at that and think, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> but a lot of people, especially if you're in the thick of it, you know, whether you're online or you're just kind of paying attention to the drift of, of the culture and, and the church in general, um, it's real. You know, you kind of you look it back and I'm, I'm a church history guy myself and it's easy to think, well, that was them and we've got this now. And we look back and think, oh, how could they have been so foolish? How could they have done this or that? But I'll tell you, I'm seeing a lot of the similar trends. You probably are too. Um, that you just think, no, 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 no. We've already been here. No, no, we need to not do this again. Like this is the same argument. It was used a hundred years ago. Why are we? We just repackage mm -hmm. it and call it something different. So, um, yeah, it's 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 crazy. I'm looking for the exact quotation. Uh, give me just a moment. I think oh, sure. I can retrieve it. Um, so one of the things that people don't realize uh, when you look back a hundred years ago, you look back at what was happening within the church and um, early forms of social gospel. And then, of course, fundamentalism took its own direction um, for the worse in many ways, but began mm -hmm. as a as a genuine uh, conservative reform movement to say they hear the fundamentals of the faith. Let's cling mm -hmm. to them. But what a lot of people don't realize is that figures like Jay Gresham Machen, who were standing for the truth in their day, were doing so because of their heart for missions. Uh, so here's something that uh, Machen says in Christianity and Liberalism. He says, the missionary of liberalism, so in the context of Christian mainline Protestant liberalism or, or what became that, which we know now um, as, as an empty shell of, of Christianity, but he's, he's dealing with this in his day. The, the missionary of liberalism seeks to spread the blessings of Christian civilization, whatever that may be, and is not particularly interested in leading individuals to rel relinquish their pagan beliefs. The Christian missionary, on the other hand, regards satisfaction with a mere influence of Christian civilization as a hindrance rather than a help. His mm. chief business, he believes, is the saving of souls, and souls are saved not by the mere ethical principles of Jesus, but by his redemptive work. The Christian missionary, in other words, and the Christian worker at home as well as abroad, unlike the apostle of liberalism, says to all men everywhere, human goodness will avail nothing for lost souls. You must be born again. Uh, and, and mm. you know, it's interesting. You know, in his day, sure. he's dealing with liberal drift that was saying, hey, let's just export the fringe benefits of Christendom to mm -hmm. the majority world. Now we've we've gone beyond that. It's it's not even just, well, let's let's build wells. Let's. Uh, start orphanages. Let's not necessarily convert them to our way of thinking. Let's not impose our model of church. Um, the the logic has gone even farther than that. It's it's bigger than just not doing the work of evangelism because now you look and you see the idea of going and doing any of that at all is regarded in many places as colonialist, as imperialist, as bringing a Western way of life that's not welcome at all. And so uh, while a missionary might not want to get into that, it, we've got to realize that we do live in a world that's becoming increasingly hostile to the hostile to the idea of Christian missions uh, mm -hmm. whatsoever. And for us to do faithful ministry in word and in deed, right, in calling for people to be born again, but also uh, inviting them to the, the way that Christ can transform a society, uh, we've got to do both. And it's exciting yeah. that ABWE has that in its DNA. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I appreciate you sharing that Machen quote. He is definitely, um, he's not known as much as I think he should be known, honestly. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's speaking of, so you mentioned he, he, he lays out as you quoted, you know, there's the social justice guy, missionary, quote unquote, Hey, let's just help these people. Right. When I talk about Jesus and repentance and sin, let's just help people. Okay. And then there's the other faithful Christian who says, no, you must be born again. Those are missionaries. And this is mission organization. A lot of times, especially in seminary culture and just kind of the church in general, there's been some ping-ponging back and forth as far as who 
or what a missionary is. So why don't you flesh out a little bit from both your perspective? I know you've been in ABW for a few years now, and just obviously that's your heart and desire and all that. But just even how ABWE sees it and just in your conversations, who is a missionary and 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 what does that really look like for either the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, the opinions of the guest might not reflect the opinions of the organization, right? Uh, <laughs> we, we talk about this a little bit within ABWE. And, that's um, correct. There, there's there's uh, even questions of what do we do with short term missionaries? Are they are they missionaries or not? You know, and and um, it depends, right? If somebody is sent out purposefully and intentionally by a church to discharge a mission on behalf of that local church and advancing the gospel, whether it's for a, a week or two or for a lifetime, um, that I think is a key distinguishing mark over and against someone who, again, regardless of the duration, if they're not sent out by a local church if they're sort of self-called, if they're supported exclusively by individuals, but the gathered body of Christ where Christ has promised his, his blessing and his personal presence um, has not been a part of that. Uh, so I'm kind of already getting into it. I go to places like the book of Acts in chapter 13, um, and I see that as instructive. And I think we get off on the wrong footing very oftentimes in this conversation because we start with the assumption, well, the word missionary isn't in Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but in a sense, it is uh, because missio, mi missionary uh, in Latin derives, or, or at least it's the cognate of the Greek apostoleo, which is one who's sent out, you know, an mm -hmm. emissary. We're familiar with the idea of the 12 apostles. You and I would both be of the theological persuasion that there were only 12 apostles, um, depending what you do with uh, uh, with Matthias in, uh, in, in Acts chapter one and um, with, with him versus the apostle Paul. But we don't have capital A apostles going around today, but there's yeah. also an apostle with a lowercase a in the general sense of an emissary or so, someone sent out on mission. Um, now, we believe there was only 12 of those sent by the Lord Jesus Christ as his direct emissaries. Yeah. But we also recognize that a church might commission an individual. And you see that throughout the, uh, the New Testament. It's not just that Paul is a missionary running around sharing the gospel, but you see clusters of local churches and house churches uh, together commissioning and, and sending on people on a particular uh, journey or task or mission. Uh, sometimes it's to bring a love offering to the church in, in Jerusalem when it was in distress. And sometimes it's someone like Epaphroditus in Philippians 2 who's, who's uh, incurring great bodily risk and harm to himself to, uh, to bring a gift and to bring encouragement. And so that idea of being sent out expressly by a church uh, on a mission um, we see that in Acts chapter 13. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, even though he's commissioned by Jesus himself, um, also in a sense submits himself to the leadership that is there in a particular <clears throat> local church in Antioch. Mm. And in the text, you have while the, the, the elders, the teachers, the evangelists, they're, they're praying, they're fasting, they're worshiping, the Holy Spirit says. And here's what's interesting. The Holy Spirit doesn't give Paul and Barnabas a, a sort of a liver quiver, sort of a, a feeling in the pit of their stomach. Hey, maybe I'm called to go out and, and realize God's you know plan for my abundant life. And, and they go to their pastor and say, hey, I'm on this journey of self-discovery. Why don't you uh, donate to me? Here's my my Venmo ID. Um, <laughs> it's the it's the opposite. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit says to that local church leadership, you set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. And then they set apart Paul and Barnabas and lay hands on them. And after more fasting and prayer, they sent them out. And that's the first missionary journey that we have in the New Testament. That little event that happens in the first few verses of Acts 13 is why we Gentiles are here today uh, talking about it. Uh, yeah. It's because the movement of the gospel started out from just the Jewish pocket of the Roman Empire um, in a significant way um, at that point and throughout the book of Acts. So I think core to the definition of who is a missionary uh, is that the gospel is at the center of it. It's done in the spirit of the Great Commission. It's making disciples. It's, it is conversionary. It is evangelistic and, and not just conversionary and winning souls, but also with the goal of planting churches. And yeah. you see that in Romans 15, that Paul says he no longer has work for a lot of the regions where he served. And so now he wants to go all the way to Spain. Well, in what sense did Paul run out of room? He hadn't exhaustively evangelized everybody throughout the whole region from Jerusalem to Illyricum in the Roman world, um, but he had planted church communities 
uh, communities that would stay as beachheads for the gospel long after he was gone, that would continue the work of local evangelism among their own people, among their own countrymen. So yeah. it's it's evangelistic, it's church planting, and of course, none of that is in conflict. You have this arbitrary conflict sometimes between, well, do we win them, do we do evangelism, or do we do discipleship, and do we focus just on teaching them? It's completely arbitrary divide. In order to make disciples of all nations, you have to tell them about Jesus, and then it's this continued process of teaching them Matthew 28, to obey all things that I've commanded yep. you, Jesus says. And where else do you do okay. that week in and week out but in the local church? Yep. Um, and doing all of that under the explicit sending blessing of the local church, just like you see in Acts 13. So um, that's a long definition of what a missionary <laughs> is. There's a lot of wiggle room in there. So yeah. if within that your thing is is digging wells or caring for orphans, um, caring for the poor. Paul said he was eager to do that thing in the book of Galatians. And so there's a lot that can be done within that. You don't have to be Paul. You can be Timothy. You can play second mm -hmm. fiddle. You can be in more of a support capacity. You don't have to have all of those front man kind of gifts. Um, but that's the core missionary task. Are you a part of a team that's doing that? Uh, but if you're off just kind of, perhaps you own a business, perhaps you're not really directly evangelizing anybody, perhaps you're in a church of expats, perhaps you haven't learned the local language, you know, that's the point at which we have to ask. And if your church wasn't really behind getting you there, that was on your own initiative, well, who are you sent out by? And, and if everybody's a missionary, then at the end of the day, uh, really nobody's a missionary in any meaningful sense. Yeah, that's actually that's what I was just going to ask you, because uh, I've heard a lot of that where you're kind of like, well, yeah, you're a missionary, like everybody's a missionary. And I think it was actually a podcast. I listened to you and um, a couple of guys you you were talking to uh, maybe back in July or something like that. And I want to say that was the title of it or something close to that. And it was, you know, like the yeah. Incredibles and all the other thing. Like if everybody's super, nobody's super. Yeah. right? If everybody's special, nobody's special. And, and in one sense. I think it was noted there. It was like, well, yeah, but how do we get the local mom and pop, you know, 50, 60 year olds who are empty nesters? They're just whatever. They're pretty much retired and they're just kind of buzzing around, you know, their town, their city. And they're, you know, faithful Christians, but like they're not really doing a lot. But, you know, if you get them, oh, you're a mission. Everybody's a missionary. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm on mission, you know, and kind of having this uh, marching orders. Well, it works, I guess, but um, is that really true? Is that really because then it kind of fogs everything over, and then it's like, well, I'm doing missions, and it's like, well, but are you? And like, what does that mean? And yeah, so no, yeah, I let me let me plug that in real quick because they they do have a helpful book on the topic. You're talking about Denny Spitters and Matthew Ellison, yeah, and they put out a book called When Everything Is Missions, implied subtitle Nothing Is. Right. Uh, and then they put out a sequel to that recently. And uh, yeah, we we do a podcast through ABWE. It's called The Missions Podcast, creative name, right? <laughs> and we've interviewed them twice now, and we've we've talked about that very thing. There's ba basically these days within evangelicalism, anything that's international or or crossing borders gets regarded as as missions automatically. And, mm -hmm. and we want to lovingly push back and say, well, are we making disciples? Is the goal to bring people together to to know Christ and then bring them together in the context of a church that can be a continued witness while also meeting physical needs? Mm -hmm. And we would pinpoint that as the missionary task. Yeah, no, that's good. Say those names one more time. Yeah, it's Matthew Ellison and Denny Spitters, When okay. Everything is Missions. I think the website might be as simple as whenEverythingIsMissions.com, but don't quote me on that. Google okay. it first. I'll find it. I'll put it in the description uh, after the video is produced. Uh, no, that's good. I mean, and and again, I mean, it makes sense. You know, I mean, it's it's. I understand the sentiment behind it. Oh, yeah, let's get everybody geared up and let's go. But then it just muddies the waters and then we're kind of back at square one. And that really seems to be happening <laughs> quite a well, bit, or it has where, happened quite a bit. Where I'm at in Pennsylvania, we've got some of that Anabaptistic influence, right? We've got Amish country, yeah. um, you know, just across the river here. And, you know, think of the brethren. Think of this very kind of egalitarian church model where we don't really have pastors. We don't really have elders. Everybody's mm -hmm. just brother so-and-so, and, -so, and we're, all, we're all equal playing field. And, you know, there's a certain element of truth to that, right? There is the priesthood of all believers. Um, but there's always a functional hierarchy that emerges from that, right? The, mm -hmm. Those churches still have pastors. And in the same sense, okay, if we're going to say everybody's a missionary, is that really encouraging the average people to 
live as missionaries or is that just yeah. kind of so daunting? Well, at the end of the day, I'm not a missionary, right? I'm, I'm a stay at home mom in, in, in my hometown, right? Or, or I work a desk job nine to five. Now we can all live evangelistically and we can all live in such a way as to advance the mission of God. And I think it's much more helpful to think, Hey, what do we do together cor- individually, mm-hmm. right? In, in, in our daily lives as we're brushing shoulders with the world, but also what do we do corporately um, on the Lord's day and throughout the week as the body of Christ to advance global missions together and local missions together. And I'd, I'd much rather talk about that because that that's where God has promised to use his people in that way and to build his church. Yeah, no, that's good. And yeah, I mean, I, it goes back to kind of what you were just saying. Like you have a missionary couple or, or an organization, but they're underground in China, right? Or they're underground somewhere else and they're missionaries, right? They're sacrificing. They don't have, they've devoid of their Western goods and all their possessions and so on. And they've been there for X number of years. And it's like, yeah, but the people over there are missionaries and this guy's a missionary and they're a missionary. Oh, they're all missionaries. And it's kind of like, like you said, it's just all egalitarian and, and really it actually lowers the bar. It doesn't really raise the bar at all. So no, that's good. Um, let's see what else we were. What's the difference or is there a difference? Just speaking of missions. Most people think, at least I did, especially as an unbeliever, you know, growing up in the church, you know, I'm being a missionary. I'm going to Papua New Guinea. It's like, I'm not going to go to Papua New Guinea. That'd be ridiculous. Why would I want to go to the middle of nowhere? What's the difference between, or is there, between international mission or international missions and domestic missions, North American missions? Hmm. Uh, again, the opinions of the the guest might not represent the opinions of the organization. No, yeah. I, I think they would largely on this particular topic. Uh, I, I think sometimes that distinction is arbitrary. Okay. And let me let me flesh that out. Um, I think we actually get into a lot of trouble when we draw a strict separation there because overseas mission, basically what happens is you can check your theology at the door. You can employ all sorts of methods that you would see as pragmatic and underhanded. Um, Second Corinthians four underhanded deceitful methods. Uh, but you can use those on the mission. Field. Like, it, you know, you can continue to identify as socioculturally Muslim uh, mm. overseas there, you know, and you can secretly confess Jesus, uh, but you can consider yourself a Muslim follower of Jesus. We're, but but in our own churches, if something similar to that happened in our context and culture, we'd immediately see through the facade of that. And so what it does is it it, it lowers the standard very oftentimes for what can happen on the field. I think missions would be helped greatly if we recognize that there's there's one central um, task of of the missionary of, of the gospel, let me say gospel worker or a minister of the gospel, it's bringing the gospel um, in word and deed, um, in the ordinances or or in the sacraments, in the local church context as well. It's making disciples under the lordship of Jesus, training them to do the same thing, um, and and ultimately seeing the body of Christ grow. Um, and be expressly evangelistic in that way. If if that kind of word-centered, simple, ordinary, week in, week out, um, faithfully preaching and proclaiming the word, if we understand that to be essentially the same thing here as it is overseas, then I, I think that we'll avoid a lot of the pitfalls because when that separation is drawn as well, and when missions is out of sight, out of mind, and cut off from the life of, of the local church, and of what we believe the gospel workers calling to be here at home, what fills that void because nature abhors a vacuum is sociology, mm. is anthropology, is psychology, is is worldly theories of of movements. Yeah. Um, these these guys are reading critical authors. They're getting their ideas about how social movements happen. They're not getting it from the pages of scripture necessarily. That's not to say that these other disciplines don't have anything that they can teach us as well. But they can't be unmoored from what we already know to be true about what is the local church here at home? What is the core of the gospel to be proclaimed? What does it mean to be a Christian? It can't be unmoored from any of those things. So I think it's the same kind of thing. I think the distinction is you're, you're crossing geographic borders and you're crossing cultural borders. Yeah. And I think sometimes we make a bigger deal out of the geographic borders and not as big a deal out of the cultural borders too. So I'd also want to lovingly encourage us, uh, you can go overseas and that's, that's vital. 
and that's important as well. But also God is bringing the nations to us here in North America too. And what can we do to, to reach them even through linguistic barriers yeah. uh, and barriers of convention and culture and tradition. Um, and, and that those are the barriers that do need to be crossed. Where we go astray is in overly contextualizing the gospel so that there is a gospel for Muslims different from a gospel for Hindus, different from a gospel for Buddhists, different mm-hmm. from a gospel for secular European atheists or uh, non-religious people or tribal religionists or LGBTQIA persons. Yeah. Uh, there's one gospel and we bring it into new contexts of language, culture, traditions and values. But the language, uh, the message of the gospel itself is a transcultural one. Mm. Yeah, no, that's true. And that's, I mean, it's something that, you know, Jesus was Middle Eastern is kind of people put that on bumper sticker and that type of thing. And we so often, we, you know, collective, we lose sight of that. And and mm-hmm. even the skeptics and the, the formerly churched people that grew up in church, but left in high school because the Bible doesn't have any answers and because their pastor was a jerk and blah, blah, blah. And they weren't really ever saved to begin with. They didn't really have a real true saving uh, faith with Christ in Christ. But they forget that, like, we're not Mormons. Like, Mormonism is an American religion. Christianity, biblical, faithful orthodoxy, is universal. It started in Jerusalem, right? Basically, yeah. right? I mean, and you know, we, depending on how you look at the church and, and the gathered body, you could go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And, you know, we're talking about, like, a creator God who upholds all things by the word of his power. A God who who engages humanity, not just a single nation or a single, you know, light skinned or dark skinned or medium skinned people group uh, or a certain language, but everybody. And, you know, to have that where the people on the fringes uh, to say and be skeptical of, you know, colonialism or imperial imperialism or whatever is just, it's nonsense because. And, and if I can, you're, you're not just tilting at windmills there because I, I had a student, I, I used to serve in youth ministry And I had a student who graduated, went to a nearby ostensibly Christian university Mm -hmm. um, and was had a heart for missions. He actually ended up doing an internship in Spain with ABWE. But he was told by one of his uh, supposedly Christian professors at this nearby school uh, not to pursue missions because it is all white European colonialism. You know, so I, I think for parents, for pastors, for lay leaders in the church, for deacons, for those that care about the things of God, um, we, we have a real situation in which it's not just political issues in the U.S. So, some of these issues have downstream consequences that can uh, absolutely um, quench uh, a, a zeal and a fire and a desire uh, for missions among uh, our students and the younger generation that we're working with. I think we have to be on guard. I love yeah. what you said, said that, you know, Christianity, obviously starting in Jerusalem, think of another world religion that was genuinely transcultural before the Christian religion. I can't think of one. Yeah. Um, no. And and frankly, even after Christianity, it, Islam is is in many ways uh, locked in its Arabic uh, kind of cultural apparatus that it mm-hmm. was birthed into. And the same can be said of any major world religion. Christianity was the only one that from the very beginning had a, a genuine missionary impulse and a, a genuine core that could be meaningfully communicated to different languages and people groups. That alone is frankly just an apologetic to the truth of the Christian message. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, well, I mean, I mean, last question, we can kind of keep going if you want uh, after that, but how does kind of bring it down practically? How does someone discern the call. Like you brought up, you know, in the scripture, uh, in Acts, some of the leaders there are saying, set aside Paul and Barnabas. Now, many times, most people, and I would say we probably both agree, if you don't, that's okay. But we don't look at everything that's happening in the scripture as exactly like this must happen now. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people do, more charismatic, Pentecostal. Uh, you're not saying that necessarily, right? That like the Pastors have to wait for a hearing or voice from God to say, set aside Alex, set aside Richard, send them and their wives to Eastern Europe. Or right. is, that, is that what you're saying? Or, or flesh yeah, that out? I'm not saying that. Uh, I, uh, 
you know, I don't want to exclude the role of of subjective impressions of God's will or direction and guidance in particular ways. And uh, having worked to to help onboard many people um, desiring to pursue missions, I've heard many stories of of um, incredible providences that God has used to move people from inactivity to activity mm. with missions. So I don't want to leave that out, but. Uh, I'm one who I don't love the word calling because I think it does imply a level of direct revelation that uh, I don't believe we're entitled to. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me put it that way. Um, I, I think if we're going to if you hear me use the word calling um, and, and granted, I do use it. I'm, I'm using it as shorthand. <laughs> okay. I'm using that yep. as shorthand for this conversion of uh, gifts. So do I have the God given abilities to undertake this task? needs? Uh, is there a reason for me to do it? Are there people in need of the gospel or whatever other skills and resources that I have to give in this ministry? Affirmation of others. Uh, is the local church, are my spiritual leaders, are my family members, are those that I trust that are more spiritually mature than I am or who are in authority over me? Do they see it and are they affirming these desires in me? Mm. Um, another criteria would be desire. Um, do, do I want to, uh, it, obviously following God is not ex exclusively about doing what you want to do. Um, but of course, wasn't it, I think Augustine that's attributed with saying, um, love God and do what you want, right? Because yeah. when yeah. you love the Lord, you do, we, what you want will be, um, in alignment with his desires. Him. And so I, I think it's the nexus of, of all of those different sorts of criteria. I think if somebody was looking for a book, um, it's it's kind of a modern classic now, the uh, decision making in the will of God by Gary Friesen. Mm. Uh, and he deals with, you know, who do I marry? Should I be a missionary? Some of those things. It, I'm not a missionary. So I grew up uh, as a church kid. And kind of the two things that you're never you never want to ask yourself as a church kid are, uh, does God want me to go to Africa? Because I don't really want to go. So I'm not even going to let my brain go there. And then it's not <laughs> calling me to be single. I don't want that one either. Right. So right. those are kind of the, the the things that you never say out loud. Um, and, and yet I do believe um, that we, we need to write the Lord an open check with our lives. We need to lay down our will, surrender it before. And we need to pray in the spirit of the Lord's prayer saying, uh, you know, that, that his name would be hallowed in all the world. Right. As it is in heaven. Um, but also that his will would be done, right, and, and not ours. We need to start from that frame of mind and that frame of heart, and then we need to be sensitive to, hey, what has God put in front of me right now? Am I being faithful immediately in the small things? I might dream of evangelism, but am I faithfully evangelizing my own children at the breakfast table uh, or my neighbors or extended family members, those sorts of things? Uh, and then fan out from there and say, what would it mean to live in faithful, ordinary obedience with the affirmation and gifts and all the sorts of things that I have and the desires um, and and even ask the Lord, would he incline our desires towards a, a particular type of ministry, particular type of people group overseas? Um, so it, it, there's another expression, you know, that, uh, that that God doesn't steer a parked car. It's not very theologically precise because yeah. <laughs> God can do whatever agree. God wants to do. Yeah. Um, but there is some truth in the fact that it is uh, wiser, shall we say, to try to discern the will of God in motion um than in sloth and so yeah. I, I would encourage us with that do do the next thing go grab a, a copy of that book or of uh kevin de young's just do something um book, and yeah. and so I, I i did not have a an experience of sensing a, a call or a great direction uh burden yearning uh, overseas um but what i would just encourage you to try to do as i try to do and only the lord knows how i'm doing at it is do the next thing. What can I do right here and now to affect the cause of missions? Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, well, this has been, this has been wonderful. Um, concise and good. <laughs> I've never been uh, accused of being concise. You'd be the first. Well, I mean, we could keep talking, but I know you're on a timetable as am I, but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm not usually accused of being concise either, but I'll, I'll count that as a compliment for you. Hey, um, brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> um, where can people find you? Are you on social media? You meant you have a podcast, right? With a a B W E. Go ahead and yeah. drop. Tell us about where we can locate you. Missions. We want to start. Somebody's watching this. I want to do something. I feel like this is what the Lord has used me to push. What What do I do? Yeah, the probably the easiest way to connect with me is by email, alex at a b w e 
abwe.org. That's a lot of letters, but it's Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. So abwe.org. Um, if you're on that website, you can find the Missions Podcast, or you could go straight to missionspodcast.com. Uh, missionspodcast.com. We post new episodes every Sunday night at 7 p.m. We've been going for about four years now, and so uh-huh. the Lord's been good to us, and it's been it's been a fun journey sure. along the way. Um, but abwe.org, there's a lot of resources there, articles, as well as videos, podcasts, um, downloadables, and then resources for your church there as well. If you're feeling called, and I use that with kind of air quotes, but uh, or if your church is is ready to get behind you, we'll come in and partner alongside you. And if you want to connect with me personally, send me an email or search for my name um, on on any social media channel. My last name is K O C M A N, Cokeman like the soda, Coke, Coke, Coke man. There, you, there go. you go. Perfect. Well, it's been a pleasure, Alex. Great seeing you again. Um, and uh, any final thoughts, last last words you want to share with us? Well, just just be encouraged. We started off the show talking about the craziness in the world around us and uh, read Psalm two. The, yeah. the Lord laughs. <laughs> he's laughing at all yeah. the nations as they're conspiring and he's set his king on Zion and, yeah. uh, and missions is just really just taking over the territory that Christ has already claimed. Mm. Um, so we can do it joyfully and we can be thinking internationally, not just about the chaos within our own borders because we have a Lord that's king of the world So be encouraged and do the next thing. Amen. Amen. It's good brother. Well, take care. Have a good rest of your day. And uh, again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on.